I'm Arlena Watt from Seven News. First of all, I want to say, as a Gumulgal person of Mabiag Island in the Torres Strait, I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of these lands, the Turrbal and Yagara peoples, and acknowledge sovereignty was never ceded. My deep respect to the elders. Well, welcome to a special Queensland media club, the battle for City Hall. Early voting is already underway, and election day on the 16th of March is fast approaching. This will be the format of the Lord Merrill debate. We'll begin by hearing from each candidate for five minutes, highlighting their plans to shape the city over the next four years. A warning bell will be rung at four minutes. This is the bell. They'll hear that, and then following those speeches, the three candidates will be seated and have the opportunity to ask each of their opponents a question. Questions should be brief and to the point, and they have one minute to respond. I'll be ringing the bell at one minute, if required, and expecting a prompt wrap-up. Then after that, we will be opening up to the media, the journalists at the back of the room where we have a roving microphone for the club's standard question time. Our first speaker for the five minute address is Tracy Price. Labor's Tracy Price is a small business owner, a lawyer and a qualified mediator. Tracy has experience in the community running a sewing centre business and a family law firm in Brisbane over the past 10 years. Tracy is calling for more affordable housing, better and cheaper public transport, a climate resilient city and a focus on reducing the cost of living. Please welcome Tracy Price. Good afternoon. I'd first like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we gather today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. To any First Nations people in the room today, I will continue to walk with you. I also want to wish everyone here a very happy Queensland Women's Week and I hope you observe International Women's Day tomorrow and that you reflect on how you can count her in and advance the economic equality for women across Brisbane and in all your circles of influence. One of the first questions I was asked when my candidacy for Lord Mayor was announced was who is Tracy Price? Other than being the only woman running for Lord Mayor, there are a few key markers along the journey that I think help tell my story. I turned 50 this year. My father was in the RAF, my mother was a dressmaker, my brother a pilot and my sister is a special needs teacher. My husband and I have three amazing children who are 21, 17 and 14. My family is the most important thing to me in this world, but my commitment to the community and how I feel about this incredible city is all very close second. During the February 2022 floods, my small business was inundated by floodwaters. The shop had been in, a location, in that location for nearly 32 years, but was never impacted like that before. It was Sunday afternoon and the floodwaters were rising. I received a call from a fellow shop owner in our small suburban complex, and he said, the shop strip is about to go under. My husband was coming back from giving blood, and so I asked him to check on the shop as he went past, but by the time he got there, it was too late. He couldn't access my shop, we could do nothing. It all happened so fast and without warning. Our small shopping strip owners reached out to council to discuss what had occurred and how there was a desperate need for drainage upgrading, but the council's response was to blame the state and to take no action. The floodwaters came from a council road and the private report we received confirmed that the drainage was inadequate for the amount of water coming through the area. We have tried to speak to the LNP councillors and to this, the, to this date, all correspondence has gone unanswered. This is when I realised, like I'm sure a lot of the women in the room have, that if I want to see change, then I need to do something about it myself. So I put my hand up to run for Lord Mayor and I haven't looked back. Why is telling you more about me so important? Well, one reason is because I'm not a career politician. I'm not a trained speaker. I don't have all the answers ingrained in my head, unlike my opponents who have spent their entire adult life being in politics. What I do have is the will and the vision to make sure that we create Brisbane the best city for the future. I've been listening and talking to people every day about what matters in their community and what matters for Brisbane. 
I've had to work much harder than my two opponents to show voters who I am. I can only be me and I believe that that me is good enough, along with the diverse team of people that all have something unique to offer this city and have a drive and a passion to do it. I've been to every part of Brisbane over the last year, listening to residents, talking to community groups, walking, working alongside the community champions who are part of my team to put forward our plan for Brisbane's bright future. Listening to Brisbane residents will shape every decision that I make as the next Lord Mayor of Brisbane. I want to bring new energy and a fresh approach to how council operates. For too long, we've been neglected, misled and asked to accept less than we deserve from this 20-year-old tired and out of touch LNP administration. Brisbane is an amazing city. It is our home and a place we choose to live, work and play in. We need leadership that reflects the goals we all have for our beautiful city. My team and I want to throw open the city hall doors and let the people back inside. I want to listen and I want them to feel heard. In the past few months on the campaign trail, and I've spent more and more time talking to people across this city, my vision for Brisbane has galvanised. We are a young and vibrant city on the precipice of greatness. What we do today will make the city what it is tomorrow or we will squander the opportunity. I'm proud of my announcements we've made so far. Record investment in housing and homelessness, half price bus fares, a billion dollars investment in suburban roads, fixing missing cycling links, backing local artists and enlivening our nighttime economy, investing in more street lighting and CCTV cameras to help Brisbane residents and women and children to feel safe taking overdue action on drainage and flood mitigation, fully funding the Brackenridge SES depot, introducing a food and organic waste cycling, recycling industry, two million trees planted, increased support for wildlife carers, putting grass back into King George Square. In the last five years under Adrian Trinner and the 15 before that, the council has That's come to a That's five minutes now, up. Tracy. There is a better way. Nearly done. <laughs> 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 All right, we have to keep this to time to make it fair on everyone and also be aware that we'll be getting to more questions later, so I'd like to get through as many as those as possible. Our second speaker is Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner, who became the 17th Lord Mayor of Brisbane in 2019, following years of experience as a councillor and Deputy Mayor of Australia's largest local government. His goal is to ensure the Brisbane of tomorrow is better than the Brisbane of today, aiming to deliver new infrastructure for a growing city and investing in Brisbane's lifestyle. Please welcome the Lord Mayor. Thank you, Marlena. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. One of the favourite parts of my role as Lord Mayor are the big citizenship ceremonies we have at City Hall. It's that sense of optimism and love for Brisbane that you can see on face, people's faces as they're becoming members of the greatest family in the world. They are positive and optimistic about the future of this place we live and they want to be part of it and they want to help create it. And for me it's personal because 50 years ago this year, my dad sat in that city hall as a new migrant and he became an Australian citizen with that same sense of optimism. And they're right to have that sense of optimism. Whether it was this year or 50 years ago, uh, Brisbane is a city with an exciting future. There's no mistake that it's the fastest growing capital city in Australia. There's no mistake that people are voting with their feet to come here. There's no mistake that we have this positive momentum and everyone knows that Brisbane is on the move, it has a bright future and moving forward. But with all of this positive momentum, our biggest challenge is growth. Our biggest challenge is making sure we cater for growth while keeping the things about Brisbane that people love and appreciate, our lifestyle, easy to get around, those things that people appreciate. And that's why my united and experienced team is committed to keeping Brisbane moving forward. We're committed to making it easier to get around. It's why we're backing a north side tunnel, a proposal that only emerged because of the planning work that we did. We're committed to easing traffic congestion by building better roads. We upgraded Kingsford Smith Drive. 
We're upgrading Moggle Road. We're upgrading Beams Road. And we're determined to make better use of existing infrastructure with new smart technology like smart traffic signals. We're, committing, we're committed to making the step change between public transport and mass transit. It's what Brisbane needs as it grows. We want to see Brisbane Metro expanded so that more residents can get access to mass transit in a way that's so frequent and reliable that timetables become a thing of the past. We're also committed to new city glider routes like the Gold City Glider in partnership with the state government. And by the end of this year, we're determined to see the rollout of the biggest boost to bus services we've seen in more than a decade. And we'll keep investing in our ferry network as well. We've been equipping our fleet with new double-decker city cats, and now we're moving towards low emission electric or hybrid ferries as well. Importantly, and critically this election, we're committed to keeping costs down for residents and businesses. We're doing this by ensuring that Brisbane has the cheapest residential rates in South East Queensland. We're doing this by ensuring Brisbane City Council keeps its strong credit rating so that we can invest in the future infrastructure our city needs. And by making sure we balance our budget, we're relieving the pressure on your budget. We're committed to growing Brisbane's lifestyle with more to see and do. We supported and facilitated vibrant new precincts like Howard Smith Wharves, like Fish Lane, like West Village. We've invested in new parks and playgrounds like Bradbury Park, like Hanlon Park and the Archerfield Wetlands. We're now investing in new sports fields as well, like Nudgee Recreational Reserve that was just opened recently. We've ensured that Brisbane residents have more to do in an affordable manner as well, like our $2 summer dips. And sometimes it's the simple things that make a difference, like allowing coffee carts to set up in parks so that parents, so that anyone can get a coffee while they're watching their kids play or even their dog play in the dog off leash area. We're committed to taking action on crime and making sure that this issue is taken seriously because Brisbane residents shouldn't have to go to bed worrying about whether their house will get broken into. This election is like no other council election in the city's 100-year history of Brisbane City Council elections. Now more than ever, Brisbane needs a stable and experienced team, one that will invest in critical road and transport projects. Brisbane needs a stable and experienced team that will fight to make our suburbs safe. Brisbane needs a stable and experienced team with a proven record of keeping costs down. And Brisbane needs a stable and experienced team that will stand up to other levels of government, whether it's on transport or overpriced Olympic stadiums. We can't afford to go backwards as a city. We can't afford to fall behind. We offer that experienced and stable team that will keep Brisbane moving. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right, our third speaker is Greens candidate Jonathan Sriunganathan, who served as a city councillor for the Gabba Ward for seven years until last year, focusing on renters' rights and housing affordability. Prior to that, he worked as a writer and musician. He's calling for cheaper rents and house prices, free public transport and less development on the Brisbane floodplains. Please welcome Jonathan Sriunganathan. I offer my respects to the rightful owners of this place, the Yagara, Yugarapal and Terrible peoples. I acknowledge that this city is built on stolen land for which compensation was never paid and that we all share a responsibility to help rectify past wrongs and ongoing injustices of colonisation. On my ride in today, I pass an old block of flats in Kangaroo Point that's been sitting empty for four years now. And yesterday morning, I counted 35 tents in Musgrave Park. These are symptoms of a broken, corrupt system that's failing ordinary residents. Our political system has been hijacked by big developers and property, property businesses. Brisbane has become a city where the mega rich get richer while the poor get screwed. Thousands of people are struggling right now. Homeless teenagers are sleeping on bus stop benches in the very shadows of City Hall. And yet the message from Labor and the LNP is that Brisbane is moving in the right direction. Their response to the worst homelessness crisis in living memory is to keep following the same strategies and policies that got us into this mess. Whereas the Greens believe a better world is possible. But even more crucially, we believe that deep systemic change is essential 
if we are to fix the current housing crisis and deal with even bigger economic and environmental challenges on the horizon. We want to transform our city to make it better connected, more sustainable and more beautiful. We already have dolphins cruising up the river and koalas within 5Ks of the CBD. That's what makes Brizzy special, not casinos and Olympic stadiums. We envisage a city where natural green spaces are protected and restored, and the river is clean enough to swim in, where the arts and late night entertainment are celebrated and supported, and there's more to do in the evenings than losing all your money on the pokies. But most importantly, our vision is for every Brisbane resident to have affordable, secure, well-designed housing. To achieve this, we need to break the property industry's undemocratic influence over our city council. Over the past decade, Brizzy has been inundated with poorly designed private development without enough investment in the supporting public infrastructure and facilities. But working as a city councillor for seven years, I realised that whenever the rate of new housing construction got so high that it looked like property prices might start to stabilise, developers stopped building. They delayed or cancelled projects and in some cases even held off on selling completed apartments, leaving them vacant for months rather than sell them at a discount. This is why we can't place our faith in profit-driven developers to get us out of the housing crisis. Developers don't want, want, don't want rents and property prices to fall. Major developers act like a cartel, intentionally restricting the supply of housing and land to keep prices high. To fight this, the Greens want to introduce a vacancy levy on investment properties that are left empty for more than six months. Existing vacant homes would be rented out or sold, helping thousands of people to get off the street. And commercial landlords would have to stop rent gouging small businesses, dropping their asking rent to retain tenants. Most importantly, by discouraging land banking and penalising speculators who hoard real estate, the vacancy levy would put significant downward pressure on land values. That would also lower rates bills for owner-occupiers and make it cheaper to build new homes. The Greens are also proposing to introduce a two-year freeze on rent increases and a crackdown on the proliferation of Airbnb investment properties. And as announced this week, we believe the Council should acquire the Eagle Farm horse race track and can transform it into public green space, public housing and community facilities. We also need to transition our city towards a more sustainable and equitable transport system. Instead of wasting hundreds of millions of dollars widening roads, we want to invest in pedestrian crossings, footpaths, separated bike lanes and traffic calming so that residents have safe, convenient alternatives to driving. We also want to revolutionise public transport, upgrading the frequency and coverage of existing bus routes while also creating 15 new high-frequency routes that run directly between suburbs. Someone travelling by public transport between Mount Gravatt and Rockley shouldn't have to ride all the way into the city and back out again. Under our plan, you'd have a direct bus service every 15 minutes, seven days a week. Perhaps most importantly for those who are struggling financially, we want to roll out free public transport, starting with free transport for kids. Some politicians will try to scare you by falsely claiming that the only way to fund better public and active transport is to put up residence rates. That's because they want to keep wasting your money on toll tunnels and Olympic stadiums. It's because they don't want to make property developers pay their fair share. This election, voters have a clear choice. You can keep voting for the two major parties who are happy with rising rents and house prices, cowboy developers building on the floodplain and overpriced buses that only come once an hour, or you can vote for the Greens who want to stand up to this corrupt system and change things for the better. I don't expect everyone to agree with every single one of our policies. But if you agree we need to stop big business running our governments and put people's needs before corporate profits, you should give the Greens a go. A better world is possible. We don't have to settle for the crumbs. All right, now for the fun part, politicians answering questions. Let's see how we go here. You'll each have an opportunity to ask each of your opponents a question. Can we keep the questions brief and to the point, under a minute? And then you'll get one minute to respond to the question. Look, I do have the bell, but don't make me have to ring it over and over again. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Uh, the Lord Mayor, your first question. Okay, I've been asked to ask a question of uh, Jonathan Shree. Sri Ranganathan. Sri Ranganathan. One of the most important jobs uh, of being Lord Mayor is bringing the community together rather than creating division. Now, Jonathan, you built an entire career on saying inflammatory and divisive things, turning sections of our community against each other. Uh, you've called the police racist, yet you've refused to apologise for racist comments you've made about Jews. You've called property developers and owners bludgers, yet you don't pay rates or rent yourself. You blockade roads, causing traffic chaos for residents. 
You've said it's okay to steal. You've repeatedly told us that you hate the Australian flag. You've educated people on how to break and enter. What I want to know is, do you actually believe this, or was this just attention-seeking? I think it's disappointing that the first question ends up just being a series of political attacks rather than a measured political debate. I guess I'd start by saying that there's an important difference between causing division and pointing out divisions that already exist in society. I don't think it's true that I have sought to divide people. I think in my time as a council, I've acted diplomatically and collaboratively, not only across party lines, but with a wide range of different demographics and sectors in the community. And I think it's unfortunate that rather than engaging with the meaningful critiques that I'm articulating on behalf of the residents I represent, that certain sections of the political class and certain sections of the media have dismissed those reasonable, well-informed critiques of the political system and said, oh, he's causing division. Like, I'm not the one saying these things. I'm articulating what the community on the ground is concerned about. And I don't think it is divisive to say, hey, some people are struggling right now. I don't think it's divisive to say, hey, we need to take, take stronger action on climate change. And certainly when the federal court has said that the police have a okay, problem with racism, I think that we need to take that's that seriously. Minute. All right, Jonathan, now for your question. Again, let's have the questions brief and to the point. <laughs> yeah, and then thanks. under a minute and then one minute responses. Thank you. Yeah, so Tracy, you and other Labor councillors have previously said rightly, I think, that you didn't support the Kurilpa temporarily, temporary local planning instrument, which rezoned sites that had previously been identified as parkland for higher density development even though most of those sites are highly vulnerable to flooding. But the Queensland Labor government approved the Kurilpa TLPI, ignoring you and the Labor councillors. And then you recently said you didn't support the Greens' proposal to ban development on the most flood-prone sites across the city. So if you and the other Labor councillors can't even get the Labor state government to stop approving floodplain development, what's the point of a Labor council that doesn't have the power to stand up to Queensland Labor and the property industry? And can we actually trust that a Labor mayor would stop new development on the floodplain given that state labour keeps supporting it? That's a really long question. It is. I apologise. <laughs> um, but I care about it. Yeah, no, look, I um, absolutely 100% support the... Um, the against floodplain, building on big floodplains. We, but the reality is, is that Brisbane is off, on a floodplain. 40% of it is on a floodplain. We need to make sure that we have housing in and around our city and that we work with people that opportunity. The balance off is that we're a separate level of government, right? We will advocate for community and what's best for that community down in Kawulpa and, and the community are very strong about that. And I've come out in support of the community and had discussions with the state about um, how important it is that the residents don't have 92 levels down there. You know, I know people that were down there during the last floods. I don't want to see what happened down there again. There was, you know, people that were in 16 floors that couldn't get out of their building um, and weren't able to get, they were out of their homes for eight to 10 weeks. I don't want that to happen. Okay, Tracy, and your first question, please. Yes, Adrian. <laughs> You've said that you'll roll out a bus depot on Brisbane's north side to house 60 of your Swiss buses, but you've told journalists that you have no intention on purchasing new buses. Is this announcement to build a bus, de bus depot just another LNP lie? Well, we know that the people of Brisbane need better transport. They need mass transit. And Brisbane Metro is the only opportunity to roll out mass transit that we have in an affordable manner between now and the Olympics. Uh, the rail projects, we would love to see more of them, but they take too long and they're too expensive. Uh, Brisbane Metro and that solution that's been put forward can be rolled out effectively uh, and we want to see it on the north side. We know that people on the north side are hungry to see Brisbane Metro. Now, the state government has committed to a transitway along the Gympie Road corridor and they previously said they'd build a busway. Uh, whether it's a transitway or a busway, Brisbane Metro can operate on that route. But you can't do that unless you have a depot. And we've just, uh, we're nearing completion on our metro depot at Rochdale. Um, and it's a great facility with the latest technology and the most modern fleet. We want to see that on the north side as well. Uh, this has to be done in partnership. The reality is uh, the state government is responsible for the public transport network in Brisbane. We've done our fair share. Uh, we put in now $1.4 billion towards metro. And we want to okay, see Lord this Mayor, go to the next stage. You have a chance now for your second question and that's to Tracy. Uh, Tracy, you've repeatedly claimed that your radical bin changes won't cost council anything, uh, yet 
just the other day, an industry expert told ABC Radio that your plan would cost at least $100 million, require a fleet of 50 to 60 new trucks, require locations across Brisbane to store Australia's largest pile of rotting waste, and you would only get support from the state to buy a few bins, not to actually collect them or process them. So the question I have is, will you increase rates for Brisbane residents or will you cut the red top bin collection from Wheatley to fortnightly, like other Labor Green councils have done? Quick answer is I'll do neither of those, Adrian. The answer is, is if we don't do something about our waste problem in this country, it's going to cost another $600 million over the next 10 years. So is that something that the current LNP council is going to imply a bin tax on residents going forward? Because you will not be able to... Um, deal with that amount of waste without incurring further costs to ratepayers. There is an industry that is waiting to open up here. Um, it will create jobs. There are people that I've been speaking to on the ground on a weekly basis about waste management. And if we don't do something, it's only going to become a bigger problem. Um, part of my MBA is I did a paper on textile waste. You know, all of these waste problems are only going to increase around the world. And it is a serious issue that we need to deal with. And if we don't do something now, it's going to end up by costing the rate payers $600 million over the next 10 years, which will be the only way you can deal with that is to pass that on to rate payers. And Tracy, your next question now. Thank you. So my question for you, Jonathan, is the reason that you have not made any announcement about making Brisbane a climate resilient city, including no plan on organic waste reduction, because you don't believe that local government has a role to play in mitigating the damage effects of climate change on our community? Or is this a deliberate political strategy to not talk about the environment? I think you maybe just haven't been paying close enough attention to some of our announcements. If you look on our website, we've got quite a detailed statement about our policies in terms of global warming action. There's all the local stuff you'd expect, like planting more trees, reducing carbon, car dependency by supporting public transport. But one of the big levers that the council could be pulling in terms of action on climate change is to say to the private sector, look, if you continue to do business with fossil fuel companies, if you continue to work on new coal projects and gas projects, you will not be eligible for council tenders. Now, this is a powerful lever. Council controls billion, billions of dollars in contracts with the private sector. And if the council starts to say to construction companies, engineering companies, even IT companies, we're not going to do business with you if you continue to support the opening up of new coal and gas projects, that sends a strong signal to the private sector. So we've got a lot to say about global warming. I agree that reforming waste collection is one small piece of the puzzle, but there are much bigger policy levers that the council can and should be pulling. I could go on all day about electric buses and that sort of stuff as well. Thanks. And now for your final question. Yeah, cool. I think my final question must be for Adrian. Uh, Adrian, whether we solve the housing crisis by building more private development or public housing or by changing government tax and regulation policies, one way or another, rents and house prices would have to fall significantly in order for lower income people to be able to afford stable long-term housing. But you've previously said publicly that you don't want rents and house prices to fall. So is that still your position? And if it is, how can we possibly reduce rising homelessness rates if the mayor of our city doesn't want rents and property prices to come down? Well, I know the only way to solve the housing crisis is for more homes to be built. Uh, and that can't be solved by the state government or even the federal government. It requires everyone uh, with their hands at the wheel building more homes. And the reality is what we've seen is um, your record in council is opposing more than 30,000 new homes from being built in Brisbane. Uh, we all remember it well. And you, you You're so dodging the question. You, do you support rents and house prices drop in? You've asked me this question in council multiple times and the answer is the same. Uh, I know that the only way out of the housing crisis is to build more homes. Now, what happens to rents? What happens to rates? Uh, what happens to values? That's a market-driven proposal. Uh, but we know that if you don't build any more homes, values are going to skyrocket. And so your approach of opposing development has actually been contributing uh, to prices going up. And we see that right across the city, wherever Greens are campaigning and protesting against new homes being built. That's impacting property values and it's driving them up further. I found the LNP table. Hey, guys. <laughs> okay, so how are we all feeling after that, getting to know each other a little more? I've got a little bit of a surge of adrenaline. Like, yeah, it's okay. nerve-wracking up here. Uh, I'd, um, I don't know whether I want to sit between the two. <laughs> I'd, um, look, I've got a question and then I'm going to throw to the 
the journalists at the back of the room. What is something that, if elected, um, you'd set out to achieve within the first 100 days? We'll start with you, Lord Mayor, and go down then. Well, obviously, uh, first cab off the rank is actually um, getting on with the next budget and the development of the next budget. Um, so that's something that um, the process gears up in, usually at this time of the year, um, but obviously we're in caretaker period. So getting on and delivering the financial plan for the next 12 months um, is first cab off the rank, but most importantly, uh, keeping rates as low as possible. That has to be the top priority. People are hurting out there. Uh, household and business budgets, is under pre they're under pressure. Uh, and as I said before, we've got to manage our budget so there's no pressure on your budget. And in the end, if you've seen the commitments made in this election campaign, we've been very responsible, very conservative about, about the promises that we've made. They are affordable and they are deliverable. Uh, we've seen um, the two other candidates making more than a billion dollars worth of promises each. Uh, Labor has made $1.4 billion worth of promises uh, and the Greens have made $3.9 billion worth of promises so far. And so oh, That's right. All right. And so uh, keeping rates down, number one priority. Yeah, so I want to look at um, the budget very closely and see where we can actually spend better. So some of the things are like getting rid of our waste on the living in Brisbane flyers, which to me is just a advertising on the LNP council. Um, that's one of the first things I want to do. I want to um, make sure that we look at and review where we can make improvements around public transport immediately to try and reduce some of the congestion. We've announced our half price bus fares. We want to get people off the roads and into public transport but they will only do that if they've got a reliable, frequent, affordable, safe um, public transport. I want to make sure that all the people that I've been engaging with, all the stakeholders, um, people that I've been talking to about things like waste and stuff like that, that they actually sit down and we formalise some of those discussions and we move forward as fast as we can to make a difference. I think one of the first and most important priorities for a Greens administration would be to reform our democratic systems themselves so that residents and key stakeholders have meaningful control over the decisions that affect their lives and that they're most concerned about. Because right now we have highly centralised decision-making processes in the council where the people who are most impacted by a decision don't necessarily get much of a meaningful say. Sometimes there's a tokenistic consultation or a survey, but residents don't actually have meaningful voting power. During my seven years as a city councillor, we introduced a process of community voting where residents got to suggest project priorities. We found out how much they'd cost and then residents got to vote for where their rates, rates money was spent. And I'd like to see similar community voting processes expanded to deal with other bigger qu questions that affect the future of the city, rather than those decisions being made entirely by politicians and well-connected business associates. All right, let's get the questions rolling in from the journalists at the back of the room where we have a roving microphone and we have Jack Mackay from ABC Radio Brisbane. Hello, thanks Marlena. Um, so there's been a lot of talk in this campaign about costs of living and keeping downward pressure on rates. My question to all three of you is, can you give a rock solid commitment right here today that in the next term of council, all future residential rate increases will be kept at or below the rate of inflation? I'll go first. So uh, you can see from our record that that's what we've done over the last uh, five years in my time as Lord Mayor. Um, we didn't actually make that commitment um, in the previous election, but we did it anyway. Uh, but what I've just said before is you can see the pressure on rates by the commitments and the size of the commitments that are being made. Uh, you cannot fund $1.4 or $3.9 billion worth of extra commitments, as we've seen from Labor and the Greens, without putting upward pressure on rates. We've made modest and responsible and affordable commitments. Rates will always be lower under an LNP administration. That's been our record. That will be our record going forward. And I can say uh, we expect that to continue. Is that, is that a commitment, Lord Mayor? Well, as I said, we didn't make the commitment last time, but we've delivered it Will you make a commitment anyway. this time? And so we'll do everything possible to keep rates low. Uh, we have the lowest uh, rates in South East Queensland. So any other council, you compare the rates, ours are lower. We want to keep it that way. My commitment to the people of Brisbane has been we will keep the lowest rates in South East Queensland. The question is will you make the commitment today, not what you want though? The reality is we don't know what future shocks are coming, 
but we know that with 1.4 billion or 3.9 billion dollars worth of commitments, uh, that will drive up rates massively. Uh, we're not doing that, we haven't made those commitments. I don't know what's around the corner. There could be another flood next year. Uh, there could be another uh, inflation crisis or other factors. But what I can say is our record is over the last five years, rates have risen lower than inflation. And you can see that. It's there for everyone to see. Uh, and we'll continue to strive for that. Yes, Jack is the short answer. <laughs> I don't, and we will be releasing a fully audited costing um, of everything that we've um, announced um, within the next week prior to the election. So everything will be is audited and the costings will be released in relation to that. And just leaning on the cost of, you know, we don't know what's ahead, there could be a flood. The response I got from council about flooding when, um, and it wasn't from a councillor, it was from council, was, well, you had insurance, right? And I'm like, well, that's not the point. So, you know, you can say that and, and I'm not going to get into a you know at back and forth debate but that was the response I've got and you know if that is the going to be the response of the council going forward that is going to drive up insurance um, astronomically and then everybody else who may not be in affected by the floods insurance is also going to go up so we also don't want to see that. Thanks for the question Jack just Quickly, contrary to some of the mayor's assertions, uh, Greens' total spending commitments per year add up to about $350 million. So we're nowhere near this multi-billion dollar figure that's... Eagle to be Farm. Hard. We're not proposing to spend billions of dollars acquiring Eagle Farm. We can... Uh, journalists are welcome to ask me more questions about Eagle Farm if you like. But uh, to answer your question, Jack, I think there are lots of other revenue sources that the council can and should be pursuing before we put up rates for residents. It's hard to give a, a clear and binding commitment because we don't actually have enough transparent information from the council administration about exactly what proportion of rates revenue comes from residential homes versus business and commercial operators. And buried within the question is a little bit of confusion about when we say, will rates go up? Do we mean that the percentage increase of rates from one year to another is going yes, to increase? Yes, the percentage yes. increase. Yes. And, and what's important right now is that for residents, even when their percentage increase is not very high, if their land values are increasing dramatically, then they're going to feel that their, ra their rates bill is actually going to go up in real terms. And this is one of the reasons that residents are getting frustrated at the moment, because they're being told that they have the lowest rates in Queensland and that the percentage increase hasn't been very high. But because their land values are skyrocketing so quickly, their actual rates bill is going up. So I can give you the commitment that before we ever considered putting up residence rates, we would first look at other re revenue sources, such as making commercial and larger uh, businesses pay their fair share in terms of rates. We would look at increasing infrastructure charges from developers and reversing the cuts to infrastructure charges that the LNP has recently made. We would look at slashing spending on wasteful road winding projects. So definitely raising rates is a last resort and it's not something that we think we need to do in order to fund our commitments. Uh, Josh Babis from Nine. Uh, for each of you, you'd all be looking ahead for your first budgets after the election. What will be the change in rates for the ratepayers who are about to cast their votes and how will you achieve that? Well, I think this one's uh, been kind of covered already. Uh, in, in, you must be planning your budget. You said that will be in your first 100 days. What will be, what's, at this point in time, what's the expected change in rates? Well, we're not actually planning the budget at the point, at this point in time because we're in the caretaker period, so there's been no budget discussions held. Uh, but ultimately, the pressure on rates will, base, will be based on what's committed to at this election. Uh, the forward agenda will be based on what is promised, and we've seen huge promises from Labor and the Greens with no real explanation of how they'll be paid for. Uh, we've been conservative and modest, uh, and that will put downward pressure on rates. We want to see them as low as possible. Right now, I don't think any one of us can put a figure on it uh, because right now we don't even know what the inflation rate will be by the time the budget comes out. That's something that's constantly changing as well. Uh, once inflation's locked in and we have that figure, then we can obviously go forward with more certainty. But the reality is the biggest factor that will be influencing rates are the big spending promises that are being made by Labor and the Greens. Um, I disagree that we haven't been clear about that because I've said all the way along that everything that we have costed um, is based on the current budget that you guys released um, last year. So we're just going to spend 
the money better to the benefit of um, all the residents across our city rather than just focusing on massive inner city projects. I, I think Adrian's actually right that it's really hard to put a figure on how much rates are going to increase, but I think it's also important to recognise that there are many different ratings categories and they all change by differing degrees each year. And so these very simple questions of how much a rate's going to go up is actually obscuring a lot of nuance. One of the things that the Greens do want to look at is jacking up the rates on the casino and on horse racing tracks. They can pay higher rates. If we put up rates on some of those bigger corporate entities... thought you wanted we to buy the horse we, racing track. <laughs> it turns out there's multiple horse racing tracks in, in Brisbane, Adrian, would you believe? Um, but the, yeah, the reality is that we don't need to be putting up rates for residents if we make property developers pay their fair share and if we reduce the hundreds of millions of dollars that the Liberal National Party spends each year widening roads. This is a huge black hole in the budget. Every year the council spends more money widening roads. Its road maintenance bill continues All right, to we'll increase. Stick to the, the this is financially the questions, unsustainable. Jonathan, because we do have a lot of journalists here and with plenty of questions to get through. Antonia O'Flaherty from the ABC. Obviously there's a review into the Olympic and Paralympic Games, but without hiding behind the fact that that review's ongoing, where do you, each of you, as people who want to be the leader of this city, want to see the main stadium? Well, look, I'd prefer less money to be spent on stadiums and more money to be spent on transport, and I made it very clear. And I would point out that the review wouldn't be happening unless I spoke up, unless I stood up to the state government and drew a line in the sand and said, this is getting out of hand, this has fallen off track. Money was being put into you know, very expensive gold-plated stadiums when things like transport infrastructure were missing out on the investment that they needed. And so my answer is I'd prefer to see less money sent on, spent on stadiums. And if we can get a location you, that, that, you don't that reduces the cost of the money spent on stadiums, that's a great outcome. Does that mean you don't want a new stadium? Well, anything that can be done to upgrade existing stadiums should be looked at. And I know there's a number of things being considered. I don't know what the outcome will be of that review. We will find out. But as uh, the candidate for the Lord Mayor, the incumbent, where do you want to see it? I want to see it in a location that saves ratepayers and taxpayers money. And wherever that is, um, I'll, be, I'll be confident that it, if it's a location that reduces the cost, that's something I'll get behind. Um, I've always said that I want to see a legacy from the Olympics to be left all across our city. I want suburban community sporting facilities to have that legacy. I want our public transport. Um, we've, there seems to be a big focus shift um, and a political argument, you know, back and forth. I just want us to get on with the job. And yes, there is a review coming. We'll see what the outcome of that review is, you know, I'm, I just want to see a legacy where these kids can have the best opportunities going into the Olympics in Brisbane. Because if it wasn't in Brisbane, a lot of those kids wouldn't have the opportunity to participate in the Olympics. And I want all of our kids across so Brisbane to have that view. Is there a location or a venue, a stadium, that you want Look, upgraded or...? No, and you know, there's there's so much creativity. I've been to Olympic venues around the world and there are so many different ways to tackle the Olympics. Um, we've got an amazing city that has got so many venues that are here. We've got potential new ones that can be done. You know, we've got age of stadiums to be considered. So part of that review process is going to inform us what is the best option. But my I always have maintained that the legacy I want is a sporting and facilities and public transport system all across this city. It's funny hearing these conversations about the Olympics because like a year ago the LNP were tearing shreds off me for opposing the Gabba Stadium and I credit to you for changing your mind and I do think it's a testament to the fact that the Greens have applied enough political pressure that the Liberals and now Labor have shifted and withdrawn their support for the Gabba Stadium project. We can definitely rule out that we're supporting a major stadium being at the Gabba. We don't think that's appropriate to displace East Brisbane State School. We can, the Greens are also definitely ruling out Victoria Park as an option for the main stadium. That's a silly idea to lose public green space and, and such a large amount of inner city public green space for a stadium. The Greens' preference is certainly that we would prefer to use existing infrastructure and the most obvious available site is the Nathan campus, but there's a lot of work that would have to happen to that site, not just in terms of upgrading the existing stadium, but in terms of public transport connections. To be honest, if it's a choice between spending billions of dollars on a new stadium 
or spending a comparatively small amount of money on a new stadium and then a lot of money on new public transport connections to move people from Nathan, I think the latter is preferable. We've released a, a initial proposal to do a delivery study around light rail connections between Mount Gravatt, Nathan, and then Hamilton and the Valley, and I think it should be an open discussion about those ideas. Okay, but so Nathan Campus. No, I, I just want to say if and no. No, um, We're not saying definitely Nathan. Location. We're saying that, that that seems to be the least bad option at the moment. But if the government insists that a new stadium is necessary, we should also be looking at sites like the Auto Mall out near the Brisbane Airport. Site. Okay, the question is though where the preferred location from each of you. And I think we've got some varying answers there. Let's keep going. I was just going to add something to that is that um, I know Adrian says that, you know, he was um, responsible for part of that review process. But right from the word go, I've had people in the communities reach out to me and I've taken all of those concerns to the state government as well. So I've advocated as a lower level. It is a, the Olympics are a state thing with, the, with it, but I've also, as my role, have listened to the community and I've taken those concerns directly to the state. All right, we're going to keep going, okay. Lydia Lynch. Seems like everyone's shady on the Gabba. Um, Lydia Lynch from the Australian newspaper. Just another question on the Olympics, on the other um, marquee stadium that's been proposed. Um, On the what stadium, sorry? Sorry, the other um, venue, marquee venue that's been proposed. Um, it's uh, Engineers have raised concerns that uh, Brisbane Arena can actually be built for that $2.5 billion um, originally planned over the Roma Street station and two other sites are being considered. Um, one at that old busy site at West End and the other site is on the opposite side of um, Roma Street Parklands. So which site would each of you prefer for the Brisbane Arena venue, which is going to host the swimming, apparently? Okay, so with these answers, let's get straight to the location. Think geography, preferred location. Well, you've mentioned that there's two locations in the running. I, I'm not actually sure that there are two locations in the running, but of the two that you've mentioned, I mean, the obvious one would be somewhere closer to the Roma Street station, which will have uh, train services and also uh, metro services. Public transport is obviously going to be critical, not just for the Olympics, but for the fact that this will be a, a concert venue uh, for decades to come and people need to get to it uh, more easily than they can get to the Boondle Entertainment Centre at the moment. And so uh, somewhere near Roma Street Station and the Metro Station I think makes a lot of sense. But once again, uh, the, the review will have a look at those things we don't have visibility of. I've never seen a business case for either the Gabba or for Brisbane Arena. Never seen it. And so I assume that the reviewers will have seen that and they'll be able to drill down. So there's questions that we can't answer without seeing this information. It's never been released. And I agree. I haven't seen any business cases. I haven't been privy to any of that information. So I can't actually comment on what would be a better scenario without being able to see costs, location, all of that information. So we'll wait for the review. Yeah, look, I think this is a fair position. I don't think any of us have enough information to make an informed decision. But I will say that I do not want to see billions of dollars spent on new Olympic venues when the government is telling us we don't have the money for public housing. So my answer is that find some small existing site, renovate it and repurpose it. Don't waste billions of dollars on a big new swimming pool just for the Olympics. Uh, Andrew Messenger from The Guardian. So five years ago, uh, 25 of 26 councillors uh, voted to ban townhouses in 63% of the city of Brisbane. And Jono, you abstained. Um, was that a good decision? I mean, rents have risen so fast. You now say supply is the key to solving this problem. Was that a good decision and would you review it in the new term? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It was a good decision. Um, and you know, we're constantly reviewing our planning regime um, because we need more houses. But our view is very different um, to the other two candidates here. Uh, the other two candidates have made it clear that they want to spread density right across the suburbs of Brisbane. That's been their clear position. Uh, we believe in urban consolidation and putting it where the infrastructure is, this, which is why we fully support and we got the support of the state government for Kirilpa. That's the right way and the sensible and sustainable way to house more people. You can house 10,000 new homes in Kirilpa alone. There's other well-located locations where we can provide significant numbers of new homes, uh, but spreading the density right across every suburb of Brisbane is not the right answer, and I don't think the people of Brisbane will think it's the right answer either. So concentrating it is a better answer? Absolutely. 
around the infrastructure? I do disagree. Um, I think that we need um, a variation of housing all across our city. Um, I think we've, we need to build it in and around transport corridors, education facilities, shopping precincts, where we can create localised jobs and localised infrastructure. So that means reviewing it or dropping it? Yes, review. I will always review. But not drop? I'm not committing to dropping, that, dropping it without reviewing. I think the frustrating thing about these conversations is that a, a fair chunk of the city still thinks it's a good idea to house more people on the most flood-prone parts of the inner city. That is madness. And I'm, I'm not even interested right now in the debate. Wake up, Brisbane. We've got to stop building more housing on the most flood-prone parts of the city. This Kirilpa TLPI nonsense is stupid. So yes, we do want to spread density around other parts of the city. We want it close to public transport hubs and train stations. That doesn't mean in every single suburban back street. It does mean we need to concentrate it around public transport nodes and commercial nodes. But we cannot cram more people onto the floodplain. To your question, Andrew, I, I, the reason I abstained from that development was that I thought residents' concerns about the type of townhouse developments that were occurring were legitimate, but I thought simply banning townhouses in a large chunk of suburban Brisbane was a very blunt instrument and I would have preferred to see a more nuanced approach. Residents were objecting to townhouse developments because they were occurring in areas that didn't have the public transport infrastructure to support them. The better solution is to improve public transport and active transport connections so that medium density can work well in the suburbs rather than just cramming more and more people onto the floodplain, which is going to set up future generations for more grief as climate change gets worse. So does that mean review or drop? Uh, we want to review the whole city plan. What's being referred to the, as the townhouse ban was a fairly small component of a package. Okay, of so a, another review. All right, let's keep going. A transformation, not a review. We want to... Review. You said review. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He wants more homes in areas that don't have green representatives, basically, is what he's saying. Actually, half the city has a federal greens rep now, Adrian, so watch so out. There won't be much happening anywhere. <laughs> Rosanna from Channel 7. We've obviously heard a lot about the Gabba and the Olympics today. In recent months, there has been a lot of controversy and political bickering around that point. If elected as the mayor, will you commit to working constructively with the state government, or if they are the same party as you, will you agree not to toe the party line and speak out if it goes against community interests? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think my record shows I can work with both sides of politics, uh, but I will also stand up to both sides of politics as well, and I've done that on both sides of the fence. Um, and as I said, the reason we have this review underway is because I spoke up, uh, my team backed me, and it was the right decision. Uh, yes, so I um, absolutely will um, advocate first and foremost for community, which I have been doing. Um, a lot of the community members reached out, as I said, very on when my nomination was raised. Um, and I went down, I met with a lot of those people in the community. They said that they, nobody was returning their calls, no one was listening to them, and I took that directly to the state. So are you ruling out support for the Gabba Stadium? Sorry to clarify. Am I ruling out Yeah, support, support for Gabba Olympics? No, I want to know okay. what the review is and then from there we can form an informed decision. But okay. first and foremost, as a, as a local government representative, then I would advocate for the local community first and foremost. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would very happily work collaboratively with governments of all stripes uh, across all levels of government. Uh, we actually, like I mentioned, do have quite a few Federal Greens representatives in Brisbane now and it's important to have that close collaboration with Federal representatives that cover the city as, as well as the state government. Um, I think, like, I know I've got a bit of a reputation as being controversial, but I've worked collaboratively with the Liberals and Labor over many years. I'm, I'm confident I can do that into the future. All right, and just a little time check. We've only got a couple of minutes, so let's have short, sharp questions and answers, please. Uh, Toby Crockett from the Courier Mail. Just on finances, I guess for Jonathan and Tracy, will you both commit to re publicly releasing fully audited costings for all your policies and promises before March 16? I guess perhaps the to tweet the question slightly for the Lord Mayor as the incumbent, will you give an update? I know last year you said that there's a $400 million black hole that you're working to address. Will you give an update on what the council's financial situation is at the moment? So yes, you will receive fully audited costings by March 16. We're actually doing that at the moment. Can you give a date? Uh, it'll be next week. Who do you get to do the auditing? 
Okay, let's let's get to the. No, answers. I'm I'm serious. <laughs> I, like, we've already published our costings online. We've gone into some detail. It's all up there on the website. Audited. Yeah, we're like happy to look into it. I can't give you a fixed date, but I think it, it, it's a very reasonable request. Lord Mayor. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we will be also providing audited statements uh, and financial statements and costings for the election. Uh, in terms of the savings that we made, um, they were approved through council uh, in late November last year. So um, that, that process is finalised uh, and so we have a balanced budget um, which helps keep pressure down on rates and rents. So as it stands, March 16, it will be even keel for whoever is Lord Mayor. There will be no, no debt, no one will inherit. Oh, only the only the projects that are underway, which are all known about. So obviously, uh, we're supportive of um, the, the the range of projects in expanding Brisbane Metro. We know um, that Labor has a different view on that, uh, but the budget has been locked in as of late November last year. Hey, Matt Deneen from Brisbane Times. Um, the Lord Mayor, I think when the Olympics review was announced, you'd said that there needed to be thinking now, kind of ahead to the next round of transport projects for the city. Um, which, I suppose, to each of the three of you, what do you think that is? Happy to go first. Uh, I Look, I've made it clear already. I think the, the Brisbane Metro rapid transit solution is the one that is most suitable to Brisbane. And in fact, um, back in 1997, the state government adopted the very first regional transport plan. Um, and that was a transport plan for the whole of Southeast Queensland uh, and covered all three levels of government. That included a network of 75 kilometres of busways. Only 25 kilometres were ever built. And those 25 kilometres carry the lion's share of all transport trips on the network. So two thirds of all bus trips, uh, of all transport trips are taken on buses, particularly on the busway network. We need more busways and transitways urgently. Uh, with the new metro vehicles, fully electric turn up and go services can be rolled out to more parts of the city in a much more cost effective way than a fantasy light rail project over the Story Bridge, which would cost $6 billion, uh, or Labor's plan, which is simply to pay money to the state government to reduce fares, something which the state government should already be doing. So we want the metro that has been rolled out, has been eight years in the making, nearly a billion dollars over budget, and we still don't know when it's going to finish. Um, so what we want to do is roll out an immediate effect on increasing routes around our city, not everything in and out of the city, which is currently what happens. We want to increase frequency, and that's something that we can do right now. We don't have to wait for a whole mass amount of infrastructure and a huge over budget. The amount of money that they've allocated in the current budget is to build this Fitzgibbon um, depot out there. But, I mean, there's no buses in the budget to build. So what are you going to put in it? You're either going to build the depot and not have buses or you're going to build the depot and increase the rates or do further cuts. I don't know how you're going to pay for State it. State government funds. But anyway... Buses. So that's, that's out there. But we want to do something that we can do right now to reduce congestion and help people get in and around the city. One of the biggest complaints I have had from people is that they have to go in and out of the city for everything. I know someone that lives at Carina and has family 10 minutes down the road at Wynnum, but to get from Carina to Wynnum, she has to go into the city and back out again. That's just crazy. We need to get people around the city more frequently so they can turn up and safer. The Greens certainly support uh, considering extending the metro to the north side. There's value in that project. But we agree that the priority right now is not big, flashy, high cost, major public transport infrastructure projects. The priority is improving our suburban bus routes. We need to imp improve those direct connections between suburbs. We need to ensure that people can get from A to B, from one suburb to another without heading into the inner city and back out again. The Greens have released a proposal of 15 new high frequency routes. You can look it up on the website, Brizzy Bus Boost. We've got all the details there in terms of where we think the gaps are in the network and the new routes we'd like to create to fill it. Importantly, we want those new routes to run every 15 minutes, seven days a week, late into the evenings, so that we can cater not just to nine to five office workers traveling in and out of the CBD, but to the shift workers who are coming home from Rockley late at night and to the families on the north side who are moving on the weekends. Th those are the gaps that we need to fill right now. We don't need major white elephant projects. We need to get the bus network working better. And we do think the council has a role to play in increasing its investment into the bus network, bring the state government to ta the table and get them to contribute as well. All right, we are getting out of time. I think that's it for questions.
questions as well. We've been around the table. All right, that brings us to the conclusion of our lunch. Please join me in thanking the Lord Mayor, Tracy Price, and Jonathan Surrounding Arthur. Thank you, Marlena.